Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, a family podcast of pirates and penguins. We're a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston. Join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, our adventures near and far, as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Dom Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. So, uh, another week, another podcast. (laughs) And today we have a great thing to talk about, which we had friends visiting today. First, how are you feeling, Miss Introvert? Uh, Energy I'm, levels? I'm still buzzed, really, because oh, good. while tomorrow I will probably want to hide in my room all day, I love having friends over. I really, I'm the kind of person who, like, once the people are, like, here and I'm, or I'm there and I'm talking and I'm having fun, I don't want the fun to end. Like, it really was very hard to put our friends into the car and, like, take them to the train station. Right. Mark and Aaron and their lovely kids came to visit with friends from the internet. <laughs> People we know from the internet. Yeah. You know, uh, what were we talking about? We were saying that the advice used to be, you know, don't talk to strangers. And don't don't, get in cars with people you don't know. Don't get in cars with people you don't know. And now we have Uber and people we meet on Facebook. (laughs) Right. Although I think our our online interaction predates Facebook by a long shot. It goes back to your blog and my blog. So probably something like... 15, 16 years ago that Aaron probably started reading my blog. Yeah. Uh, something like that's that. quite a, yeah, that's quite a long time ago, but we've, you've known her, you've probably known her. She got, she got to know you from me, but, but you've known her for uh, several years through social media and your circle of friends. Right. I mean, what well, she started reading and commenting on my blog and I started reading and commenting on her blog. And so we've known each other sort of blog friends wise for Probably a good 10 years at least. Yeah. And we have mutual blog friends. Yes. And then I, I connected with her on social media. So we've, yeah, we, we know each other very well, I feel. And so when you meet somebody who, at least when I meet somebody I've known online, I feel like old friends and new friends at the same time. It's kind of. Yes. I think a lot of people have, have, have there's enough people out there who've made friends through social media now and that, that they've known only through social media until they meet in person, that it's a fairly common experience this idea of people that you meet for the first time that you know really well yeah and that's i think that's the thing and we've done this a number of times not not like not so much i don't think i think that maybe the first ones we invited over to our house uh but yeah probably we, we've had people come to town that we've met up with uh we've, we've been to other people's houses we, we've slept at the houses of people we've only known from the internet yeah <laughs> although we knew we we'd met up with them several times before going to their house for a party or, you know, a get together. Uh, So, but it, yeah, it's really this, this really amazing experience of connecting with people. And, and it it was, we had a blast. I mean, they were here most of the day and the conversation just kept flowing and flowing. And it was a really good time. They were, they're really wonderful people to talk to and get, they're easy to get along with and their kids are really nice. Uh, I, I assume Aaron and Mark are listening to this, so I, <laughs> I, <laughs> but but I would say it anyway because it was a what a great visit. It was a a, a really nice time, and yeah, I'm, the I'm, kids had a blast. Yeah, and and knowing though that you're an introvert, introvert which means that uh, personal experiences are a drain, emotional drain, as opposed to emotional uh, battery. Is that what, is that what it is or whatever? Uh, that your down is coming. You're, you're, right. <laughs> you're still riding high, but your down is coming. So I'm, a, I'm aware of that. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was, so it was a nice time. And we, we, we shared a couple of meals with them and it was really nice. Uh, so that was today. Earlier today, we had mass at our usual parish at our usual time. Uh, but it didn't go as we, uh, would have hoped. Yeah. We had an asthma attack that interrupted mass. Uh, yeah, so the lesson learned is always have an inhaler in your bag. <laughs> and, you know, I usually try to, yeah. and somehow I've been switching back and forth between bags and the inhaler, I think, got taken out when we went on our camping trip and then just never made it back into my purse. This is why men only have one wallet. Yeah, well, 
Yeah. But we still can't put inhalers in them. You can't put an inhaler <laughs> in your wallet, so you would still need some kind of bag to transport it if you had to have one. This is true. This is true. I mean, I suppose you, you could probably fit it in a cargo pants pocket or something like that. Right. Well, except except this one, because it's a child an inhaler for a child, has the big... Uh, it's the big honking thing. What do you call that? It's a chamber. Yeah, a chamber. So the, you, you, with a usual inhale, you have to inhale it as you're spraying it, which seems to be more coordination than most kids are capable of. So this, you spray the medicine into the chamber, and they can inhale it from that chamber, uh, which, has a, which has a one-way valve. Yeah, complicated they, one-way valve. Yeah, they breathe in, it lets it through. When they stop breathing in, it closes and doesn't, doesn't waste the medicine. But yeah, the the poor guy he started having trouble. He, ben started having trouble breathing with uh, mucus and other stuff. Sorry. Uh, hopefully you're not eating lunch or dinner. Uh, <laughs> as we were driving to mass, and then it only got worse once we got there. And I think part of it is the perfume ladies. There's a few ladies who sit around us. Possibly. We're very nice. They don't wear excessive amounts of perfume necessarily. But you don't wear perfume. We don't. We're not around perfume, so it. I think it's more of a problem for him yeah but he i mean he woke up in the middle of the night with an asthma attack so i think it could also be the the fall pollen i think we got seasonal there. allergies going on uh, everybody to to. <laughs> everybody's a little bit sniffly this week unfortunately yeah. including me yeah that's true yeah so you had to take him out and then you drove home which is not close it's like five miles each way so it was about it's about <laughs> which when I say that Jenny Townsend always laughs because when I say our house is not close to our church, it's about five miles. Yeah. She has to travel like three times that. Right. But it's but it's a good 10, 12 minutes. Yeah. And so that was enough that leaving church, coming home, getting the inhaler, giving him some medicine and then driving back. We we left right at the very beginning of mass during the a opening processional prayers, hymn, yeah. opening prayers. And then we got back right in time for the consecration. Yeah. So we, we slipped into a pew right next to the door until communion time. And then we kind of slid into the pew with the rest of the family. Yeah. Well, m- moral, you've morally met your obligation. Yes. So, so um, then we, everything was okay after that. He, he's been fine the rest of the day. Yeah, he was running around batting, uh, batting the Arling House children with swords and having a grand old time and, and riding his bike and yeah. climbing and everything. So, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, asthma is just kind of like that. Especially when you wake up in the morning. That's actually, that's the worst time for allergies, I find, for me. Right. Either, either yeah, first at thing in the night morning or first thing in, right before bed. Yeah. And then, uh, so that was this morning. Yesterday, we in this, as, as we're talking about this, Saturday of Labor Day weekend, uh, was the Cub Scout Fishing Derby, our Cub Scout pack uh, that the boys attend. And now Lucy. Lucy is a, a tiger cub for the first time. She's just joining. Uh, they had their first uh, pack meeting on Friday, and there was Lucy in her cute tiger cub Very uniform. Cute. Oh, my so goodness. Cute. She has the uniform pants. We got the smallest pants they, they make. Shorts. The, the shorts, the uniform shorts. And then you had to... Pull them in. I, so they're the kind that have the little elastic waist that, with the buttons so that you can cinch them in. And I think I had to go 12 spaces on both sides. <laughs> and then she could still fit both arms into the waistband <laughs> loosely, but at least they weren't falling off her hips. Yes. She, and then we cinched it with the belt even more. She's the teeniest, tiniest of all cubs. And this was the smallest one they had. Yeah. Yeah. So, but she had a blast. I, they did, she, did, she did so well. She and her brothers, fish. well... Well, so the pack meeting, her brothers were so good about watching out for her, making sure she sat with them and uh, that she knew what to do and when to stand and when to salute and the whole thing. It was very cute. Uh, yes. And then so Saturday morning, we got up early. We went down to the uh, the, the Island Grove p- uh, Park pond or lake uh, where we had the fishing derby. And so here I am, me, three kids, uh, three fishing rods. I brought my rod. I don't know why, because I don't get get to use it, because I spend my time running back and forth, untangling things. Although, yeah, at first there was a lot of tangles, and then we moved to the, there's a bridge that goes over the water, and there was nothing for them to tangle the 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 line in above and to them and to the side, so that would solve that. But the constantly having to get a new worm, cut it, put it on the hook, I, 
I gutted so many worms on Saturday. <laughs> See, was, I would have just made them do it themselves. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't want to have impaled thumbs. Uh, oh, I suppose yeah, they'll that. they'll get there. The Ben is close to the where he could do it himself. So we'll, uh, we need to go fishing. That's what it is. Right. So, uh, but and Ben didn't catch anything, but he's okay. Even though last year he caught the biggest fish. This year he didn't catch anything, but he kept saying it's okay. I'm I'm okay. It's called fishing, not catching. You know he he he's heard the lingo. Lucy, first time she's ever been fishing, she caught a seven inch largemouth bass. And then uh, and then Anthony kept going. Oh, I didn't catch anything. This is terrible. This is not good. Oh, oh I caught a fish. This is the best thing ever. <laughs> I mean, it was literally almost like that. Uh, and he, and of course, his fish was eight inches, an eight inch largemouth bass. So, of course, that was even better because it was a little bigger, a little bigger than his sister's a little yeah. competitive. Uh, but he's got a very competitive streak. Yes, that's OK. And uh, and it was fine. We we didn't stay. all. We stayed a couple hours. Uh, I had to get back and uh, record some of uh, Jimmy Akin Mysterious World episodes. Uh, but uh, and the big girls and I went to the farmer's market. Yep, Just the three of us, which was it was a nice outing. Oh, uh, we got some fruits and vegetables and uh, some stuff for the bread. for the today the visit of the uh, the Arling house. And then we we stopped by the grocery store and picked up some stuff and mm -hmm. yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was, and the weather's been gorgeous, so that's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, the the heat has has broken, and we've got that nice early fall weather where it's seventies and dry and sunny and really nice. One of my favorite times of year. Yes, this is the best. New New England. New England fall is just awesome. By the way, have you seen the latest forecast for Hurricane Dorian? No. There is the slightest possibility <laughs> that it will uh it, that it could grease New England on its way out oh. to the North Atlantic uh by the end of the week. Oh fun. So we'll keep an eye on that. It's that should be fun. Some some weather. Hurricane podcasting. Live streaming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah. So for all of our listeners who've been affected by Hurricane Dorian, we're really sorry. Yes, yes, I, I yes. Uh, hopefully, you all are coming through it okay. So, uh, what have we been eating? So, uh, we've had a, a couple of good, uh, interesting dishes this week. Uh, the other day, I made the Chiang Mai chicken. That was yummy. Which Ben loves to talk about. Well, Chiang Mai chicken. <laughs> Yeah, it's Chiang Mai, as in the 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 city in Thailand. It's a recipe that comes from, as you might have guessed, Milk Street Kitchen. Uh, it's either going to be from Milk Street or from the America's Test Kitchen. One of those. Uh, that's, that's I get a lot of recipes from those, as you know. Uh, and so it's a it's a Thai recipe, and you take chicken parts, and this we use the bone in chicken breast, and you make a marinade. And it's uh, cilantro, fish sauce, soy sauce, brown sugar. And a couple other things. You can put lemongrass if you have it. We didn't, the supermarket didn't have any lemongrass. We don't usually have it very often. It doesn't suffer from not having it. Uh, when you, you put all that in a blender and you blend it up into this green, it unappetizingly colored. And not good smelling. Bad smelling marinade. Oh, it's, it's not marinade. horrible. I mean, it's fish sauce. It does not yeah. smell good. It's, you know, fish sauce is fermented fish. I mean, it's what you'd expect it to smell like. The first time we made this, I remember we're like, being very dubious going okay we need to make we need to meet, have an alternate plan just in case right we we had a backup plan i think so you you marinate it then you cook it and it also has this chili lime dipping sauce oh, is, uh, so lime good. juice so uh, chili uh, chili garlic sauce uh brown more brown sugar um and it sweetens tangy it's, and it's a sweet tangy spicy, spicy sauce so you and then you bake the chicken or uh, uh, broil it, really. It was, uh, no, bake it. Baked it, yeah. yeah. Um, I could or roast it, I suppose you could. Yeah, I could probably grill it. I, I think I might try grilling at some point. Yeah. And that would smell up the house last. Yes, it would. <laughs> I was afraid that our house was smelling like fish sauce today when our visitors came. But yeah, we ba you baked we, I baked. That, yes, yes, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, it was, it's really good. It's really, so it's, yummy. it's a little spicy. So some kids don't like it for being but, spicy. But our but our non spicy eaters Ben liked it. Liked it. Ben liked it. Uh, Debella, I I don't think she was a fit, big fan. Yeah, but it's it was really good. It was really good. So it's 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 a really good recipe. To, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Even though you probably need to have a Milk Street Kitchen uh, membership to to see it, but you'll be able to see bits of you know the the picture anyway. But it, it was and it was good. So we made that. 
Uh, you also made, uh, on Friday, you made some quiches for today for lunch. Yep, I made some uh, spinach, bacon, mushroom quiche, and then I made a... Um, what do you bacon call it? and potato. Bacon and potato quiche. That was good. That's like a, sort of like a baked, a, a baked stuffed baked potato quiche. Huh, I didn't think about it that way, but yeah. Yeah, you could, I mean, if you, if you add a few things, like some chai, like chives or Ooh, uh, scallions. I like the way you're thinking here. And, of course, the cheese. I could have I added scallions, With a little sour cream on top, too. like after it. Mm. Serve it with some sour cream. That would probably be, that's actually kind of, or like you could almost do like a, a, a loaded potato skin quiche. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, and, now, now I, I won't. The, 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 the wheels, wheels are turning. Are turning. Yeah, <laughs> the wheels are turning. Uh, uh, I also baked some banana bread. But special banana bread. I found I found a recipe on Facebook, and uh, I think it was one of their like promoted, uh, sponsored ad things. Yeah. Really anyway, um, for tasty, it was cheesecake stuffed banana bread. Cheesecake. Yeah. You think? Hold on. Hold on to that <laughs> thought for a second, folks. So you take banana bread, all the moist, rich goodness of that, and you stuff cheesecake in the middle of it. <laughs> I mean, oh my it's gosh! Not, I mean, it's not literally stuffed. So you you pour half your banana bread batter into the pan, and then you mix up this cheese, uh, cream cheese, with some egg and some flour and some sugar. Next time, I think I might add a little bit of vanilla to get a little bit more cheesecake oh, flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you sort of pour that into the middle on top of your banana batter, and then you pour more banana batter on top, and it kind of creates this like almost a marbled effect. Yep. And uh, and I was very dubious. I, I I messed up. I accidentally added the egg that was supposed to go into the cream cheese mixture into the banana mixture and didn't realize it until it had been blended. So it was a little bit eggier than it was supposed to be. I think with with the correct proportion egg in the right place, it would have been a little bit less mushy. Yeah. Uh a little more bready. Yeah, this was almost like a pudding sort of. A very like like a like a British pudding. Like a bread pudding sort of. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it was but it was good. Like the flavors worked really well, and I made I made a double batch, two loaves, and they were both gone. Yeah, it, it was good. I think <laughs> everybody loved it. Uh, so. Some people went back for thirds. Yes. Yes. Uh, so and then uh, you also made a, a drink. You made a shrub. I did. Did we talk about shrubs before? I do not remember. All right. So quick, quick little bit on a sh what what's a shrub? Uh, it's it, they go they date back to the 1700s to the colonial era. Yeah, the based on the idea that the most refreshing kind of drink when you're hot is not something that's really sweet. It's something tart like lemonade that's more more refreshing. Same idea, except instead of lemons, except, you're right, instead of citrus as the tartness, it's vinegar. Vinegar. Uh, and you, okay, now you, you've suddenly, I, I've heard you all say, oh, ew, vinegar, it's a drink. No. Ah, but what, still, so what, did, how did you so, make So basically, the, there's a really simple ratio, and you can make them two ways. You can cook your fruit, or you can macerate your fruit for a couple of days, but I go for the cooking because it's quicker. Um, so it's a pound of fruit to a cup of sugar and a cup of water. You put it in a pot and you boil it, well, simmer it. Uh, until your fruit is like really, really soft. Then you strain that. And you kind of sieve. push it through the sieve and mush yeah. it through the sieve. Yeah, mush it so that you get most of the liquid out into your bowl. And then you add a cup of vinegar. Like, but, and, but not just any vinegar. Like, <laughs> that's very important. Don't, don't just like add like distilled vinegar or. Although I've seen recipes that suggest that you could. You, you've got to match the vinegar, the, the type of vinegar you use to the type of uh, fruit that you're. I, you, I, I like, think. I like like the um, white wine vinegars because they're they're a little bit lighter in flavor. Right. If you throw a cider vinegar on top of, say, watermelon, you're not going to taste watermelon. Which which I did. Which we've learned. Yes. Yeah. It tastes like cider vinegar with a with a slight tinge of watermelon, but you can't really taste the watermelon. Right. The proportions of that, that was also not, when I didn't cook, it was a macerated. And so I think yeah. the watermelon flavor was not as strong. So this one you did what? I, I had some, some peaches that had gone mushy, like the, like, like, you know, when they get mealy and mushy and nobody wants to eat them right. and everyone just kind of looks at them and goes, ew. Uh, and I had an apple that a child had like eaten half of and then discarded and had been sitting on the counter for two days. And so I... Chopped those up fine, you know, cut off the icky bits of the apple and uh, used the rest of it. And so it was like peach and apple. And then at the end, when I added the vinegar and put it in the refrigerator, I added some basil leaves. 
Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a peach basil peach basil shrub. shrub. And then when you want to drink it, what do you do? Uh, I I pour some club soda over ice and then just a, a tablespoon or two of the shrub pour a, for a big glass of... So for like eight ounces of, of soda water, a couple tablespoons of... Yeah, shrub. a little goes a long way. Yeah. It's a strong flavor. And so it's... It's sweet, it's tart, it's tangy. And and thus it's not overpowering when you make it. It's it, it's good. It's really kind of good. Yeah. yeah. And this one had a really nice a pleasant basil-y flavor. You said this was white wine vinegar you used? White wine vinegar. Because you can also use like champagne vinegar. Yeah. That would have been good. Yep. It's a little bit more expensive. Yeah. With champagne. Uh, yeah, I I've seen the suggestion of pairing strawberries with the balsamic vinegar, which sounds intriguing. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure about that one. Um, I wonder if if I would want to use uh, the 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 good balsamic, the real stuff, as opposed to the caramel stuff. Maybe so. That they have. Uh, so it's but it's good. What you made was the, so this peach basil shrub. I don't maybe use a little less basil. Ah, uh, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe. or let it sit in the ba the basil sit in the shrub for less time. Less right, right. So by the time we tried it, it had been sitting there for like. Three or four days. So the basil was a little stronger versus the peach than maybe I think would have been ideal, but it was still eminently drinkable. It was still very yummy. Um, and I bet if you added some rum or... I've, it, I've, yeah, I've, I've added some, like a shot of various alcoholic beverages <laughs> to different shrubs. Amaretto is kind of nice with peach. Mm. Uh, or like an orangey, like a Cointreau, you get kind of a mimosa sort of effect. Interesting, interesting. No, not mimosa. What's no. the one with... Orange and peach. With the, 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 the um, uh, I I don't remember now. Anyway, actually, a mimosa might be kind of good, like a sparkling wine instead of club mm -hmm, soda. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That could be interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's all sorts of like there's you could use just about any fruit, and you can add all sorts of herbs like lavender or, uh, mint. All sorts of different like herby herb fruit combinations, and right. I've made a lot of them like because I tend to use like the old mushy fruit that the kids won't eat so sometimes it'll be like three or four different kinds of mushy fruit to get a to a pound of fruit so it'll be like a little bit of apple a little bit of peach some blueberries some cherries just throw it all into the pot and cook it and it's good no matter what you use cool oh so yeah it's it's good yeah i, I i'm still some of the combinations i like better than others but yeah. uh it's fun to try it, and it's you, you you make it yourself. It's out of just stuff you have on hand, which is it's another good use for leftover fruit that nobody stuff. wants. And also, yeah. once you've cooked the fruit, you can actually eat the fruit. You put it in the, put it in a once container you, in the fridge, you've... and yeah, you put a little ice cream on it or something. Yeah, or the kids have just sometimes just eaten it with a spoon, like mushy peaches with a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> Suddenly, that mealy peach that you refused the other day is appealing again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's magic. <laughs> cool. All right, so that's what we've been uh, eating, and in this case, drinking. And uh, so we'd, we'd love to hear what what you've been eating and drinking. In fact, we've got some feedback today I'm going to read in a little bit that uh, talks a little bit about some of that. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. But first, I want to talk about what we're reading and watching. Uh, so uh, I'll go first because I have a ton of stuff that I've been, oh, okay. I've been watching. So uh, and I'll save some of it for next week because I, just, I don't want to go on and on. But I watched a movie, uh, an old movie, Force 10 from Navarone. It's an old World War II movie from the late 70s. The title sounds familiar. <clears throat> so there were two movies. It was The Guns of Navarone was the was the Right. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Right. And then there's Force 10 from Navarone, which is the sequel, which Navarone has nothing to do with the, the, the plot of this movie. So like Navarone is an island in the in the I think in the Aegean Sea or something where the, the Nazis had set up a, a gun emplacement that they had to destroy in the first movie, the guns of Navarone. But they don't go to Navarone in the second movie. So but it's they had to make it a sequel. So they had to reference it. Right, because otherwise ha nobody would know it was a sequel. Exactly. So you have to have a title that sounds sequelish. Now this one, other people, Harrison Ford, as it, it, right, and it, yeah. it, it rolled between that he had between Star Wars: New Hope and Raiders of the Lost Ark and Empire Strikes Back. So he was makes me sad I didn't watch it. Yes, uh, it's it's interesting watching because it's a, it's an interesting to see him at that stage in his career. I like uh, yeah. It, it, um, who doesn't like Harrison Ford? It also stars the actor who stars is, is loose. He was in it. The actor who was um, th he played Jaws 
in the James Bond Moonraker movie, the guy with the metal teeth. Oh, so dude, dude, the yeah. really big dude, you know, uh-huh. uh, yeah, he played, yeah, he would play a, um, uh, so they had to go to the Yugoslavia. Uh, uh-huh. And he was a a, a Yugoslavic uh, partisan, uh, uh, you know, fighting against resistance right, right. against the Nazis. Uh, so the, the 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 premise is they have to blow up a dam, and they have like this British explosives expert, and and, and so on. So it's it's just it was kind of a fun movie, not a, not a, one of the best war movies, but it was still pretty good, uh, and uh, I enjoyed it. So that was a good one. Um, then uh, now this was very exciting. Uh, Alton Brown's Good Eats is back. The, this the classic Food Network TV show that was on for from 1999 to 2015, I think it was or 13. I forget, I forget who exactly what it was. And then went off the air, and people have been saying, "When's Good Eats going to come back? We want something but more." Uh, and they finally brought it back. They've kind of brought back the stuff that but not on the food. Is it's it still on the Food, food Network. Network. Okay. Yep, it's back on the Food Network. It has the same magic, the same formula food science the jokes the, you know the corny humor corny corny jokes the alton brown personality uh has all all the things that made it good the funny props and people in costumes funny props people in costumes including fridge cam fridge fridge, fridge cam microwave cam oven cam and cams in new places <laughs> um they the, the the same some of the same actors secondary characters are back like the the woman who played w the the equipment mm-hmm. uh, it's so so really a lot of fun um, it has a lot of them. It, and then some of it's been updated. Uh, they, they update. They, he's able to do, as he says, he's able to do things that he couldn't do before because people's tastes have, have caught up. Um, things are now more available than they used to be. So he's doing a, uh, sous vide episode because the immersion circulators are much m- more, uh, available. Uh, he just did an episode last, t- last week on, um, quinoa and chia which he never would have been let, allowed to do. Oh, those would be too weird and exotic. Right. And, and now that's it's things are. that people are eating. So it really, it's a lot of fun. I'm really glad that he's, he's back and doing these episodes. It's, it's a, it's sort of a, uh, a little bit of a throwback. Uh, and you, you're the one who introduced me to Alton Brown. I don't think right. I knew about him before we met. Yes. And I mean, the, the, I, I'll, one of my catchphrases is always, uh, that would not be good eats. <laughs> yeah. The kids, the kids know Alton Brown and love. Yes. Love. They've watched some of the episodes and they really enjoy it too. So, and we went and saw Alton Brown's stage show that time, a couple of years your ago. Birthday? For my birthday, a couple of years ago, we went to, it's now two years ago. That's kind of funny to think about, but he did a tour, a live um, sort of comedy food science tour. <laughs> it was a very, like, it's hard to place the genre of that show. It was a bit eclectic, but it was all had to do with food. And it was his personality and it was music and there was audience participation. And <laughs> yes, it was, it was a blast. You have to admit it was, that was, you had fun, right? It was fun. Yeah. It, it was not something I would have chosen to do. Like, yeah. like if you asked me if I wanted to go see a show, Alton Brown would not be on my top 10 list. Yes. But, but it was, if but, you ever but, get a chance. But going, go, but going because you wanted to go was, you know, it was a treat. Yes. That was one of the best birthday presents. <laughs> um, so that's, so that I watched that last week. And, and then it, you took me to Hamilton. So yeah, and I, it all evens out. Yes. We're, it evens out. Um, luckily, I wanted to do both. This is Dom Bettinelli, CEO of the StarQuest Production Network, with a special message. StarQuest needs your help. Over the past year, we've grown by leaps and bounds. Every month, we produce dozens of shows covering numerous topics and all explore the intersection of faith and pop culture, which is the core of our mission. Some are among the most popular shows SQPN has ever produced in all its 13-year history. We're fulfilling our mission of evangelization in a whole new way, but that success is in danger. We must reach the financial break-even point if we're going to continue. Creating a dozen shows has caused our expenses to go up. We currently aren't making ends meet, and we're We're rapidly eating through our reserves. Soon they'll be gone and we'll have to cut back many of our shows. We might even have to shut down altogether. That's why it's crucial we hear from you right now. Please visit sqpn.com slash give today and click the Become a Patron button to make your monthly pledge. Or to give a one-time gift, click the Donate button. The need is urgent, so please go to sqpn.com slash give today. Thank you from all of us at StarQuest and God bless you. May we hear from you today. Then I also watched the new trailer for The Rise of Skywalker, the Star Wars Episode Nine, the ending of the Skywalker saga. Uh, that was fun. The kid, so it was fun. I watched it, and then the, I had the kids watch it the next day. And the 
watching it through their eyes, the excitement, the, oh my gosh, like the emotion, the raw, honest reactions. I wish I'd recorded it because it was just so awesome to see the, that, that, re, so in the, in the, the trailer, there's this moment where Ray, the, the main character, the good guy, looks like she's turned to the dark side of the force. And she's a bad guy. And the kids are all like, what? And they just could, their minds had been blown. They could not understand what was going on. Yeah. I, I almost wish I'd seen it before the, you showed it to them because it was my first time seeing it. Right. So you were shocked and weren't paying attention to them. Uh, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't, I was paying attention to the trailer or not. Totally should have, totally should have had the, the video camera rolling <laughs> on you guys. So, um, and then related to that, I've been, I finished reading the new Th uh, Thrawn trilogy. So Thrawn is a character a Star Wars character that's um, originally it's kind of going to go back to the 90s after uh, the uh, the Return of the Jedi came out there was no Star Wars for 10 years right more right. than 10 years uh, and all we had was this new set series of books that told us the story of what happened after Return of the Jedi if you were geeky enough to read Star Wars right well in fact the 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 books that really made that respectable so to speak <laughs> in certain circles was this trilogy by Timothy Zahn that followed this Grand Admiral Thrawn, this Imperial Admiral who had been off on some distant mission with his fleet during the, all the events of the movies and had finally returned just after the Emperor had been killed. Spoilers for a 35-year-old movie. Um, <laughs> and, and so he is trying to defeat the, the New Republic and put the Empire back in control. And Thrawn was this alien who was... Very different from all the other imperial soldiers. He was calm. He was a brilliant strate strategist. Um, he used his knowledge of a particular culture's art as a way of understanding their the way they saw the world and thus how he could defeat them on the battlefield. Interesting. It's a it's a it's a fascinating uh, conceit. And so the, the, this whole trilogy of books, people love these books. And then when The Force Awakens came out, it invalidated all of those books. Oh, It relegated them all to because all of that that backstory, all that post Return of the Jedi story was thrown out the window and was 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 turned into they call it legends. Star Wars legends. And what what exactly does that? Mean? It means they want to keep selling the books, but don't think of these as canon. They're not part of the Star Wars canon. They're, they're just stories. They're that just you might have been right, right. Stories that people have told, myths about the old times. Uh, so I, you can't see it, but I'm kind of rolling my eyes. Oh yes, I can. I can hear it. Uh, so <laughs> they, uh, and I know you well enough. So uh, what they, what Disney now has done is. They've gone back and started to mine the best bits of those books and all that content that had been created and set aside and bring some of that into what's now canon, the new canon, the extended universe of Star Wars. And Thrawn, as a character, was one of those. And now we had the same author, Timothy Zahn, has written a new trilogy about this character, telling about his origins up to the present. And... So, so, so this is different from like so it's he's he's the same character in the sense of he's has the same characteristics the same outlook the same way about him he has the same he's still a grand admiral all that sort of stuff he just has different events in his life that led up to this point that's really confusing yes my my, my brain would not be able to handle that i don't <laughs> think well it's been long enough since i read the first books that i can i can I, I it's been more than 20 years since i read the first books so I, it doesn't bother me I, I suppose like distance creates fuzziness in memory. Right. And I'm old. So my memory is fuzzy to begin. Right. With. Right. So, the, so that's all that to say that this new trilogy was very good. And it takes us, it takes them up to a place where we actually saw uh, Thrawn in the animated series, Star Wars Rebels. And we, and we see some things happen in that in his fate in that. But, um, but it's really, it was really well done. That's all that to say is, is a fascinating. How does Thrawn in, uh, in, uh, deal with the Emperor, and in, in how does Thrawn deal with uh, Darth Vader, That's, i. e. Anakin Skywalker? Spoilers for a twenty-five-year-old mm -hmm. movie. Uh, so uh, you know, it's it, so it was a really good series of books, and I'm, I'm I'm happy to have finished those. And I've I started a new series. I'll talk about that next time. But uh, 
So that's what I've been reading and watching uh, a bit. Melanie, what what have you been reading? Because you haven't been watching. Um, no, I haven't been. Oh, uh, what have I been reading? You, you finished Neil Gaiman's? Not Neil Gaiman, Neil Stevenson. Oh my gosh, I keep doing that. Neil Stevenson's book, The Fall. The, the, the two Neils. Just Fall. The, no, The. Not The? No, just, just Fall. 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 Okay. And with a subtitle, Dodge in Hell. Could Dodge is a character. Right. Dodge is the protagonist from his uh, previous novel, Reamed. And uh, so... I, I really almost can't say anything at all about this book. Right, you've talked about this book the last couple of it. episodes. Yeah. So, we, you know, we don't have to go, go into too but, much. But it, but it was, it took a turn for the strange. And there are things, there are things I really liked about it a lot. And there were things that I just wasn't thrilled with. And it kind of, the, the, the way the book kind of fell out reminded me a lot of uh, Stevenson's novel, Seven Eves, where there's a span of, several hundred years between the first part and the second part of the novel in seven eves in this one there's there's a similar split not in terms of time but just a very odd discontinuity that's works sort of within the story but it's kind of jarring as a reader like where you just jump yep. from one world to another right uh, it it sounds like stevenson has this this tick in his writing where he 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 has these cool ideas, but he he doesn't know when to pull them back. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it, it almost felt like, in retrospect, Reamed was almost the setup because he really wanted to write Fall. But he couldn't write Fall until he, he couldn't told, write he told fall the story until he of told the backstory of these characters and who they are and why we should care about them. Because if you just read Fall on its own, you wouldn't care about the characters and you it just would be very hard to get into the world. And I'm going to guess that this was originally one book and his publisher said, no, <laughs> that's way too big. I wouldn't be shocked because, I mean, Fall itself was both it, novels. Both novels are were men's like books. Like yeah. more than 700, 800 pages he, novels. Stevenson doesn't write short novels. No, not really. Uh, but I liked it. It was fun. It was interesting. And uh, I, I want to find some other people who've read it to talk about it with. You know, this, you said talking about seven E's and how it jumped like seven hundred years. I've read novels that have done that, where they you suddenly jump a lar such a large span in time that where the characters that you got to know and love in the first part they're gone, they're gone, and they, you're like they're, they're, they've become legend, myth. Like they're they're now the Homeric, the stuff of Homeric epics. Yeah, and within it's like, the culture, and it's, it's sometimes it's so jarring because you didn't get to say goodbye, you didn't feel a resolution, you didn't, you you connected with these characters and they've suddenly been torn away from you. And and honestly, I felt that like with Seven Eves, the the new set of characters and the new world just didn't make that emotional connection with me. I I found a hard time caring about them, and so like the second half of the novel kind of felt like this is an interesting, intellectually but emotionally, I was just very distant. Right. And I had a hard time. Yeah, I, I think that happens often it. with with when they do that to stories where you just the, it's like the author has had, the author knows in advance that I'm going to jump. And so they're emotionally prepared. But you have no but you have no where that's where the story is going to go. Right, right. And it was it was just. Yeah, shifting gears that much is really hard. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a narrative gamble. And I'm not sure I've seen it done said in the way that was satisfying to me as a reader so what else you said you started reading something new but you haven't got very far in it. uh yeah i started reading john henry newman's novel loss and gain which i had never heard about he, until so he wrote a novel right. the saint saint it was soon to be saint john henry newman yeah he's going to be canonized this fall and so a friend of mine uh proposed a book club for those of us who want to know more about him and want sort of an easy entry into his writings she she proposed that his novel, which is sort of a semi autobiographical novel, like the characters are kind of based on himself and his friends, and I think it's kind of a novel of ideas. I mean, he was he was a convert from the Church of England. He became Catholic, and so far the protagonist is at Oxford, where John Henry Newman. Oh, went to school and where he had his conversion. Right. And so it, it seems like it's kind of treading that. And it, it was very much like the first couple of chapters 
it's sort of like these people are talking about some big ideas here and I, I need to come back when I have a little bit more focus because I can't read this book when I'm tired. Right. There, there are books that you can read when you're like really just dead tired. And I tend to read like juvenile fiction or really light fiction when I'm just not my brain isn't firing on all uh, cylinders. That sounds it sounds interesting. Right. And I also I yeah. I've also just I've been uh flipping through some short stories by Diane Duane. Um right, the sci-fi novelist. The sci-fi novelist. Uh although I got to know her curiously because she wrote a series I've talked about it on the podcast before of uh, fantasy novels. There's sort of science fantasy though. Like yes. The Young Wizard series, science magic. There's magic, but they call, I think one of the terms, like, is, it, is it urban fantasy or urban magic? Well, urban fantasy kind of strikes me as being a little bit different than this. Like, I would call the Dresden Files urban, urban. fantasy. This right. is much more, I mean, it's urban in, in some of the novels. Like, the first novel, the characters live in near New York City, and they, part of it takes place in the city. But it's magic in the modern world. Right. The characters are modern. They, they're... um. Yeah, they live in our world. Our world doesn't know about wizards, but but magic and, and magical creatures exist in a sort of pa hidden, parallel, secret. Keeping way. in mind that this series of books existed decades prior to Harry Potter. Right, right. Oh, yeah. But, way. but it concerns young people who discover that there are wizards in the modern world. Right. In, 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 that I, there's a hidden society of wizards among us. I think it's better than Harry Potter, frankly. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, Harry it sounds Potter pretty fans. good, especially um, given that, as as we said before, that Diane Duane has thought out the whole magical system and that there's an internal consistency. There's this conservation of matter, conservation of energy. Uh, the rules of physics apply even to magic, and so it costs more to do things that would cost more energy yeah. in our world. Uh, we don't want to rehash it too much no. because we've, we've talked about it before. But but so you're reading some of her other short stories that aren't in the Wizarding. Right. I series. think one book, one story in the collection, I think, is from the Wizarding books. I haven't got to that story yet, but there's been some interesting stories. She has written many different things. She's written Star Trek novels and other things. There was there was a novel that was took place. Uh, one of the stories in this collection took place in ancient Rome, and the protagonist is a child who is a, a boy who is a slave who works in the Colosseum, uh, and he gets a wish fulfilled and it's it's all about the gladiatorial fights. It's pretty cool. Mm. Uh, lots of interesting, like gritty details about the kind of the, the sort of stuff that you don't always hear about Rome. Like what's it Rome like from a slave's perspective mm. and drawing a lot of interesting parallels between like ancient Rome's sports culture and our sports culture. Like there is a very big sports culture in ancient Rome, including betting and bookies and um mm -hmm. you know people yep. who are fans and it it feels very modern at the same time as a feeling very different uh i've re been reading some poetry and some essays and uh listened to an interview with one of my favorite poets uh a.e stallings and that's been my week i've been trying to get school preparation stuff done which is taking right. a little bit more energy away from even though we don't really take the summer off from school there is a there's, we have to kind of have a new mindset like of, i'm still stuck i mean for me like the school year starts in september is hardwired at this point because that's my entire experience of school and so even though we homeschool year-round I, I feel like september starts a new term so new new stream of history even though we kind of actually already started it in august um kind of so and I, and i have to send a letter to our school board explaining what my education plan for the coming year is so i do have to sort of sit down and put some things on paper i have to order some books and sort of decide what books to order and yeah there's some planning involved so I was trying to remember the name of the Dying Duane book that I really like, the Star Trek novel. It's called The Wounded Sky. It's from 1984. Uh, and it's it was one of the best Star Trek novels I'd read, um, featuring some some really imaginative new things that they really couldn't do on Star Trek. Although, as I'm looking, it turns out 
they it was adapted for the script for a, a Star Trek The Next Generation episode. So I need, now I need to go back and look at that again because I don't remember anything like, like like that. So I'm going to have to go back and take a look. It was the, the first season episode where no one has gone before, um, where they go to the edge of the universe. So kind of... It sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, it does. It doesn't sound like the book I read, which had some fascinating mm. uh, characters. So uh, Excellent. So um, I... I we're we're both really tired from uh, entertaining today, so we're going to finish off with feedback. Uh, for, and we've been going for forty five minutes now, so that's that's not a short episode. So uh, we do have been getting some awesome feedback from you, the listeners, that we would love to to share and to talk about. Uh, let's see. Uh, John T. Cotton writes on Facebook, two thoughts about a house phone. First, if you still have an unused copper phone line coming into the house, it may function as a 911 only emergency line. Plug a phone into it, check for dial tone, dial a random number and listen for a recorded message. Or second, a cheap, Interesting. A cheap prepaid cell phone just to keep in the house for emergencies program with emergency numbers. This was in the context of saying like we we have a truck. Even when Bella, we feel like Bella is old enough to babysit the others while we go out. She, we don't have a house phone, and she doesn't have a cell phone for emergencies. And so the the so this was some suggestions. This, I don't think there's a there's a phone jack in this house. I don't remember ever like in the ten plus eleven years we've lived here. I don't remember encountering a phone jack. Do you? Hmm. There might be one like behind our bed or behind one of the bookcases in the office that we haven't right. moved since we moved or, in. Or maybe at the base of the wall, uh, the brick wall that separates the kitchen and the living room. So that would be behind a bookcase now, too. The yeah. problem is that our house is lined with bookcases. <laughs> and so we've we've and we've the bookcases have pretty much except with one or two exceptions have been in the same place since we moved in more than 10 years ago. Because, well, you know, how often do you pull all the books off and move the furniture of that right. the bookcase? And so we don't really remember what's behind them. <laughs> Well, and I think at the time I would have said, "Oh, look, a phone jack. We don't need that." And I'll just push the bookcase up. Like if there's a if there was an electrical outlet, I would have run right. uh, a, a you know power strip or something like that off of it. But I would not have thought to even remark that there was a phone jack back there. Yeah, because we um, had no good need for it. A prepaid phone that's just for emergencies. That's that's a that's yeah, a pretty good idea. As long as you keep it charged and and, and plugged in. Yeah. Of course, the other alternative would be, as we discussed, is leaving one of our phones here with her yeah unlocked unlocked well she knows my passcode or right could we i think we talked about that last time so that yeah. would be another option so lee harshbarger sends an email says uh, i really like this addition to the podcast uh, i think you meant network uh can't help you with the neighborhood kids the her problems mm -hmm. with trying to figure out how to deal with the uh, the neighbor kids uh, well, I can, but most people wouldn't agree with me. <laughs> he says, uh, your recipes and your homeschooling adventures sound pretty neat. If I heard you correctly, you said you had trouble with chicken on the grill sometimes. Uh, well, he offers a recipe. He says, uh, try this. Really only works well for thick pieces of chicken and chops. Pat completely dry. Brush on olive oil, kosher salt, and coarse black pepper to taste. Heat entire grill surface. Very hot. Put meat on for one to two minutes. Flip. Gives good grill marks. Turn off the heat on half of the grill. Turn heated side to medium. Place meat on unheated side approximately 25 minutes. I do this on a gas grill, but each works equally well on charcoal. And then he gives us some uh, advice on some uh, spice uh, spice rub. Uh, th thank you for that. That's really good. That's actually kind of what I do already. Is uh, it's we we are only we are charcoal only. So um, I put the char the coals on half the grill and put the meat on that side first to give it the the sear on both sides and then move it to the uh, the side without the the charcoal under it, and put the lid on, and and bake it that way. So it's it's not so much that technique. It's it's sometimes the for whatever reason that the hot side of the grill when I'm trying to get the that that the initial heating, the initial cooking done, um, it flares up and smokes terribly. I think this is what we were talking about last time. Do you remember? I I don't, I don't remember exactly what what you're referring to. So I'm, maybe I'm off base, and I had said something else. But uh, but that's one of the issues I sometimes have with cooking on the grill is, is uh, the 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 fat drips down and starts burning and causes smoke and it gives more of a smoky, unpleasant burnt fat smell as opposed to a pleasant charcoal <laughs> grilled smell. So um, so that might be the part of the issue. So um, although and as I think about it, it might be better to try doing the reverse, which is, is to cook it on first 
on off the heat off off the flame well then wouldn't it wouldn't it drip like not onto the coals it would exactly and then once the fat had rendered you could move it onto the coals to crisp it up and in fact i could probably hope i wonder if you put maybe put a pan under it under the grill yeah but that might actually catch fire so i have to i have to think about that that bit but but yes uh that might that might work too so i have to think about that uh so thank you for that uh, Tammy LML on YouTube writes, great episode. I will definitely check out some of the podcasts y'all mentioned when we talked we talked about some of the podcasts that families could listen to together. Also th- thinking there must be a new SQPN recipe exchange program. Uh, LOL, good stuff. Yes. Uh, so we, I mentioned before that uh, we'd be, we have to figure out some way that people can exchange recipes uh with with each other we can share our recipes with you uh maybe we'll I may set up like a facebook group or something oh that'd be fun so if if you if you'd like to if you would be interested in such a thing let me know it's send us some email and, and we're at bets b e t t s at s q p n dot com uh, let us know and and see if that's something you'd be enjoy or be interested in and we'll figure out a way we could share recipes uh, as, as as best we can uh it would be a lot of fun so uh, I think that about does it for us. So what do you think of, what did you think of our discussion? Any things we had to say and uh, any things we, that we did? If you have any suggestions or feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can go to sqpn.com slash bets, B-E-T-T-S, or the SQPN Facebook page, which is at facebook.com slash Media. You can also send us an email to bets at sqpn.com. And I'll put links to uh, all of our relevant uh, things that we discuss in this episode on our show notes at sqpn.com. If you have not yet subscribed to the podcast, say you're listening off of the website or a file that someone sent you, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or even on our SQPN YouTube channel where you can hit the bell to get notifications. Make sure you do that uh, so you get notifications when a new episode goes up. So, until next time, I'm Dom Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. 